What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 4040 Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Colette Abdallah, and I'm joined today by a special guest, Seso Nadi, a former player for the Egyptian national team. Um, how's everything going today? It's going well. Yeah, good to be here. Thank you for having me and excited to um, get this started. Awesome, awesome. And she's calling us uh, all the way from Cairo. So this is a big <laughs> deal. We're going uh, international, going global here. You're actually the second Egyptian national team player that we've had on the podcast. A uh, friend of mine plays for the men's national team. So we're covering all sides here. Uh, so let's let's start all the way in the beginning. Uh, you grew up in Egypt. When, where did you grow up in Egypt and when did you start playing sports? Yeah, so I I am uh, born and raised in Cairo. I lived in Cairo my whole life. Um, I'm the youngest of four siblings. So all my siblings kind of, um, all, all of them played sports. So like kind of like being born, it was like no brainer that I'm going to like, you know, get into something. Um, I think I played a bunch of things first before sticking with basketball. Um, so that was kind of interesting uh but i come from like a sports family so parents played sports my siblings played sports um and then kind of once they settled into basketball my mom was like you know give it a try see if you're gonna like it um i hated it at first and then i just wanted to you know hoop by my, by myself like on the side um but then yeah i got into the team and then fell in love with the game and then started really young um and then since then i've only played basketball what what other sports did you play growing up? I played a little bit of swimming, and then I hated the water. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. And then I played gymnastics, and then um, the coaches were not very friendly, so I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do this. Um, and then it took some time. I was like, you know what, I not don't want to play any team sports. Um, but then like joined basketball, and like that that everything changed. Okay. Okay. I would have, I was, I would have suspected like soccer or handball. I know handball is a big sport over there, <laughs> tennis or something, but so mostly individual stuff and then basketball. Yep. So when did you start taking basketball seriously? Like when was it something that you really focused on? I think since um, early age, really, um, like I mentioned, like my older three siblings all played basketball at that point. So they were all heavily involved in the game um and they would like you know train me teach me like how to dribble like do all that kind of stuff um so i kind of knew that i had the skill from like early on and it was just a matter of like developing it and you know um like working more on my stuff uh but pretty from pretty early on because i'm very competitive so i kind of like always wanted that like you know next thing um so once i got um into the team and you know like started that like competing even like you know you're five and six year olds like that's nothing but just that kind of like mentality um was kind of like huge for me and that kind of like set me up for success later on mm -hmm. and what teams did you play on growing up was it like club teams competitive teams recreational teams what was that structure like uh when you were maybe in like middle school age yeah so we play here at club teams um we, you can play in school but it's more recreational um so we play at clubs so i played um at the egyptian shooting club and that's where my siblings uh played also um so that's where i played um and then that's pretty much where i played um uh, all of my years in cairo up until college and then i like left new york so i played at the shooting club okay so even in high school you played there as well you stayed at the same club yep okay okay and at what point did you start uh thinking about playing in the u.s at the college level um i think once you hit the point where you um like start thinking about the national team and then competing like internationally and like you know joining international tournaments and stuff like kind of like the under 13 under 14 is when you're like okay like it's time to take it serious and see like um how far you can go um, I think that's the time where you, where I kind of like got a, a fought ahead and then was like, um, you know, I want to like have a pretty good couple years, like, you know, between like the 13 to 16, 17, um, and kind of like take that to the next level to play college basketball in the U.S. Um, it's the highest level of playing uh, when you're playing in a college in the U.S. Uh, the competitiveness and the level playing is very, very high. Um, so I was like, this is something that I want to work for. Um, and I think it will benefit me. I mean, at the time I was only thinking about it, um, athletically, 
But like, mm-hmm. you know, later on, I realized that it also opened a lot of other doors for me besides the court. Um, but that's kind of was my goal from early on is that like, I'm going to join the national team, going to play good years here, um, make a couple international appearances, and then um, like go to college in the U.S. and play basketball there. Yeah. So tell us about some of these international appearances. Uh, I believe you played in some junior Olympics and uh, some other, was it FIBA games as well? Mm-hmm. Some junior FIBA games. Yeah. Tell us about that experience. What was that like, you know, traveling abroad with uh, the national team? Yeah, it was, uh, it was awesome. Um, I think like besides the fact that you are playing with um, like the best girls in the country, like, you know, the team consists of 12 of the best uh, players in the country. So that in itself um, improves your level play and your new skill set. But I think more than that, too, it was um, like it taught me a lot of other things um, like discipline, like what it means to be responsible. Like, you know, at the end of the day, when you're playing for your club team, you you kind of get around with things. You know, there's no such thing at the national team. Like if you are going to play around and someone else will replace you. Um, so there are like a lot of other things that you had to take seriously for you to survive besides just how good you are or how many points you can score. Um, and that includes like being a good teammate. Like no one wants to play with, you know, like a bad person or something like that. Um, so my first international tournament uh, was kind of like, it was the most difficult one in terms of like, it was just very eye opening. You know, you had always play mm. at a comfortable level. I would say um, even when you compete here nationally and stuff, like there's still that like element to it, that like familiarity, I would say. Uh, but when you play internationally, you just don't know what to expect. You don't know what the level of play is going to be. Um, you don't know how, you know, if we lose one game, you can be out for the rest of the tournament. So there's just that like next level of seriousness to it. Um, and then it definitely gives you a ton of experience. Um, you meet other players, you see other philosophies, other coaches, all of that. Um, so I kind of started with the under-16 national team, um, and we played, like, the African tournament, and then we qualified for the World Cup. Um, and then, like, year after year um, from that point was, like, every year was, there was a summer um, of, like, an international tournament. Mm-hmm. Was there a specific tournament or game where you realized, you know, I belong at this level, I can play, you know, like you said, at the highest level at the the college level in the US? Um, I think all along, like, or since you joined that, like the national team, you kind of get that um, confidence booster, I would say. Um, And you kind of have to make yourself believe that you belong in order for you to survive. Like it's, it's a big like mental game too um to like question yourself or doubt yourself or to think like you know am i good enough am i working hard enough am i doing enough um so part of that is like when you make it to that level you have to stop with that um thinking and think more about okay how can i succeed more how can i make it to the next tournament how can i get more playing time how can i help my teammates win um so it's like a mindset shift as well um and then in terms of like like a big tournament that I was like, and still to this day, I think it's like one of my favorite ever tournaments um, was the Youth Olympic Games in China. Um, And I actually played um, three on three there. And it was like very early on with like the three on three. Yeah, it was like, you know, had just started um, becoming popular and stuff. Um, And we won the African tournament. We had first place, so we qualified. We went to China. Um, and that was just like a very cool experience, like not just with other basketball teams or other basketball players, but you're with like a really big sports community. So it was, it was very cool. Yeah. I'm sure you made a ton of connections with, with athletes all over the world and things like that. What was your favorite, uh, like travel destination that, that you got to play in? <laughs> travel destination. I don't know. That's a tough one. It, uh, to be honest, like all of the tournaments that, uh, or most of the tournaments that I've been to, we rarely ever had time to explore the cities okay. that we were in. <laughs> sure. So I don't know if I can even remember, you know, some of the things that I've done besides the games. Um, but, um, I mean, China was cool. 
Turkey was cool. Um, Russia was interesting. It was cool. Like you get still to see these places and like travel the world, and that itself is a privilege. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't. You know, I, I think I I have them more in my mind where like we won in this tournament, so that's a good memory. Okay. Versus like we lost, so like I don't want to remember that. All right, so you're focused on the hoop. You're not focused on the the touristy <laughs> yeah. stuff. I I can respect that for sure, for sure. Uh, so you have all this experience. You're traveling the world with the national team, winning tournaments. What was the recruiting process like? When did schools in the U.S. start reaching out to you? I'm really curious about how this process works out, especially internationally so what what was that like yeah um and i will say too like so i um went to college in 2016 so that's like gosh seven years ago <laughs> um and back then it wasn't really all that popular like i remember when i was um uh, reaching out to colleges and talking with coaches and stuff i at that time like had known like three total girls from Egypt that like went to colleges in the US. It was, you know, not popular at all. Um, it was like still around the idea of like, you know, parents being worried about like, you know, sending you abroad and all of that. And there weren't I was a ton definitely of gonna people. ask about about like the cultural blockers, barriers, whatever yeah. you want to call it. You know, I mean I know Egypt is a pretty conservative place, maybe not just religiously conservative, but socially conservative as well. So Maybe you could tell us about that as well and how you overcame that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was saying, like, it wasn't just, um, it wasn't happening a lot at the time. So you just didn't know what to expect. You didn't know how that's going to happen. Um, but luckily, also because of the international experiences I've had and the couple older friends that I had that was able to, um, like, get some information and stuff, Um so in terms of, I think there's like two things to that, like there's like the recruiting process and then there's like, you know, just, um, as you said, getting over like the fear of like traveling abroad. Um, and luckily for me, my family was always um, supportive of that. Like they knew um, this is something I wanted and this is the next level for me. Um, and they kind of saw that. So they did not hold me back at all. If anything, like they were always um, encouraging me and pushing me. And I mean, of course, there's like an element of fear to it. Mm -hmm. uh, because you just don't know, you know, and you're sending your child all the way across the world for college, you know. Um, I mean, college is a big thing in itself. Um, so going yeah, absolutely. for college across the world, that's like, you know, um, that's a lot. So, um, but again, like to me at that point, I was like, I'm very comfortable where I am. Or I, am. I have all of my my friends, my family, my community. I already play at the highest level. So it also felt like, okay, but what's next? Like I'm 18 and I've already accomplished so much. Like there's, there's no point, you know, in staying if I really want to um, develop myself. So that kind of what pushed me. Um, and then the recruiting process was kind of like all over the place, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I had coaches interested in me um, kind of like going into like that senior year and stuff. And as I said, like I was actively looking to but it was also a matter of like finding the right fit at the right time with the right opportunity, uh, which is hard to know when you are not there because all you're doing is just like, you know, through emails and uh, video calls and stuff. So it was a lengthy process to say the least uh, from like transcripts to um, highlight tape to, um, you know, everything, everything. Um, and I remember even arriving three weeks late because of like visa stuff and you know getting oh, wow. over that um yeah so it was definitely an exhaustive process um but it was worth it definitely worth it yeah so are you are you identifying schools and then reaching out sending your highlight tape are they reaching out to you directly or to your coach or your club can you give us a little more detail into into how that plays out yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a mix of both, I would say. Um, I had schools reaching out to me that were interested in me. And then I also had my eyes on a couple of schools that I was interested in. Um, so you kind of like qualified that way. Like I was trying to see like who meets my requirements, who um, I'm like comfortable with um, or like want to join that program. What were your requirements? Program. Just carry out, out of curiosity. What, what were your um, requirements? Just like school records, like program records, um, you know, how long that program has been around. Um, the coach, I mean, when you talk with players and when you talk with the coach, you're able to tell, you know, 
are you going to get along with that coach or not, which is a huge thing. Um, you know, the school record, um, your major, like what I want to study and how good that major is at that school. Uh, destination was also like important. I knew I wanted to be on the East Coast. Um, so mainly like, you know, New York or like Boston or these kind of states. Um, so a couple is that of factors to be closer like to that. home. Um, I think a little bit, yes, but it's okay. also like more familiar. Like I was familiar with New York, you know, and uh, even though I ended up going to a school in upstate New York, which was six yeah. hours yeah. from the city. So <laughs> <laughs> that's like a different story. Um, but yeah, just like, a, you know, a couple of things. And to be honest, at the end of the day, it was just, it was still like a shot in the dark. You didn't know hundred percent what you were signing up for. For sure, for sure. And so you end up at, at Roberts Wesleyan, which is a, a Division two school, like you said, in upstate New York. Why did you choose that? Was there a few other schools you were deciding between? And ultimately, why did you pick uh, Roberts Wesleyan? Yeah, there was. Um, and it kind of came down to like really um, like a few schools. Um, and then I talked with the coach at Roberts and he um showed a huge interest in um signing me and he did not have a point guard at the time and all of that um and it was kind of those things too that like he would take initiative in like getting my paperwork done and like you know no like let's let's figure this out let's get this done let's do that let's do this um so i kind of just felt comfortable in that regard um and i had no idea where where rochester is when i tell you i did not even <laughs> know it existed i did not yeah. know it was on the map um <laughs> But it's just kind of like these things that I talked to assistant coaches. I talked to a couple uh, players from the team. Um, and I was like, you know, like, let's do this. Like, I had thought way too long about it to the point where I was like, I will never make a decision that way. So you just have to take the leap and kind of see where you end up. Um, and that's what I did. And I arrived in September of um, 2016 and played all four years there. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's get into the basketball. But first, I mean, how was the the culture shock of coming from Cairo? I know you've been around the world, so you've seen some you know different places. But what was it like, you know, being in Rochester, dealing with that weather and just the the major change in, in culture? <laughs> yeah, um, glad you asked because it wasn't easy. Um, so the weather, um, I, I just like yeah, the lifestyle was very different uh, for sure. Not so much basketball wise like it's actually the other things that kind of took me time to adjust to including like the weather like it's very very cold in upstate new york nothing like cairo um so i it took i mean i still people said like you know oh you will adjust like after a few months no i never adjusted <laughs> i would still hate the cold um so the weather was like a big thing for sure um kind of um like it was also you're coming in as a freshman, you have older girls on the team, um, how to navigate that and how to kind of like earn your spot in a different way. Um, and don't get me wrong, like I always worked hard here and stuff, but also like I had reached a very comfortable level of like knowing, oh, like I'm going to walk into any team and like, you know, get X amount of it. Like I know that, but like when you reach college, everyone starts from scratch. Uh, you really have to work for your spot. You really have to earn your spot. Um, and playing with players from with different ages too is something that you have to get used to. There are mm -hmm. like upperclassmen, there's lower classmen, um, all of that. Also navigating um, uh, academics, um, like you know, figuring out my classes and like kind of doing both. Like you, your day would start really early for like a morning lift or a morning workout, and then you would like shower, go straight to class, and then like quickly get something to eat and then get back to workout number two you know so it's just a, a very different lifestyle and you kind of at that point have to set your priorities um to kind of know like what are you trying to get out of here are you here for the experience are you here to really make the most out of it are you here to party you know what i mean um so it kind of mm -hmm. makes you mature really fast in that regard yeah i mean you have no choice i think at that point you're by yourself in a different country, you know, thousands of miles away from home, you know, new culture, all that stuff. So I'm sure you had to grow up really fast. Uh, so as, as far as the, the basketball, 
So we talked about the culture shock in, you know, being in New York and all that stuff in upstate New York, just to make sure it's very different <laughs> from New York City, as I hope people know. But as far as the basketball went, the style, the the organization, the the way it was played at the college level, did you experience a culture shock there as well? I mean, I wouldn't call it a complete culture shock. Uh, was it a different level of play? Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Um but I also like expected that you just did not know exactly what it looked like, but the definitely like, the game is faster, the game is stronger, it's more physical. Um, some of the rules are also different from like FIBA rules, like college yeah, rules are yeah. different. Um, so that's like was something um, like I had a ton of travels called on me that first year because I was just used to the Euro step, you know. Um, so like a couple adjustments like that, uh, but definitely like the game, as I said, like, because you're also in college now. So the whole level is just like, you know, like way higher um, than like high school or like what you're used to. Um, so yeah, you just have to be physical. You have to be quicker. You have to be better. You have to always improve. Um, you really can't stay where you are. Like every day you go to practice to get better and to work on um, your weaknesses because otherwise you're just gonna, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not gonna survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I went through your your stats and your game log. You've had some big games uh, over that that four year mm -hmm. stretch. Uh, what was the point where you feel again like this is where I belong, and I finally, you know, you, maybe a point where you felt comfortable with the level, with the speed, with the physicality, and all that as well. Yeah, um, I think halfway through freshman year, um, like kind of took me that first like two months of games to it was like very up and down um you know till like i kind of got the hang of it and was able to like you said like okay breathe and be like okay i know how to do this i know what's going um around here um like i, I belong like you say uh so i think like the first like semester or so is kind of when i like experienced it all so like going into that second semester or that like second half of the season uh was when i was like okay like I know, you know, what, what to do here. I know um, how to get things done. So it definitely took a couple months to adjust to everything, the lifestyle, the level of play, um, my schedule, um, all of that. But I think by the end or by like, yeah, by the second half of the season, I was like pretty comfortable at that point. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sure that was difficult because you had the extra layer of, of getting used to a, a new place, a new country and a new school, all that stuff as well. So you know, credit to you for, for that. So what was the highlight of your college career? Is it possible to pick one or two? Um, highlight. So I was actually going to transfer after my first year because I was like, you know, I like, I like it, but I'm not sure if this is where I want to spend my next three years for multiple reasons. Um, but mainly because of like Rochester is very different from Cairo. Um, Cairo is a huge city. It's loud. It's busy. There's a ton of people. It's warm. It's nice. Um, Rochester is nice, but in different type of nice. Um, but it's also very quiet. It's very cold. It's you know it's just very different from what I was used to, and that kind of was hard to adjust to, even with the basketball and even with academics. That was like I don't know if I want to do this for the next. Um, or three years or so um but kind of and that will like kind of what drew me back was the people um like roberts is not the biggest school it's like kind of like a small school um in rochester but the people that i met that first year and that helped me get through the transition um the friendships i made the professors i met all of that was kind of like wow like i really did not like this place at first, but now, sure. you know, with all the relationships I have and with all the connections I made, um, this place feels cozy and it feels nice. And people are um, supporting me in ways that I, you know, just did not think of. Um, so it kind of like made me think more about that aspect of the experience and not just the the outside factors that you would think of, sure. I would say, um, and kind of like, you know, here we are seven years later. These are like some of my best friends um, now that I made in college and some of the best people I ever like interacted with. 
That's awesome. Um, those I'm sure those bonds are are lifelong. You guys spent you know a lot of years together. That competitive fire and stuff that that really builds the the bonds and the relationships. Uh, so as your college career was was starting to wrap up, were you thinking about playing professionally anywhere? Was that a prospect for you at all? Yeah. Um, and funny enough, I used to joke with other girls on the team um, uh, when we, when they were saying like, oh, like senior year and that's it. That's like the last year of basketball for us. And I'm like, how can you do that? Like, how can you have a scheduled retirement date? Like, that couldn't be me. And my goal all along was to finish college and either like go play overseas or um, go back home and play, you know, for my club or a different club and like, you know, play professionally. Uh, but it was always the goal to keep going um, and keep playing more. Um, and up until senior year, really, that was the plan. Um, I'm going to finish and, you know, got my degree and everything. And it's time for the next thing. Um, and then COVID happened. Um, mm. End of my senior year, right before my senior year ended. Um, and that's kind of when things changed for me. And it changed in terms of like, it changed how I think and changed my perspective. Um, of how I, I view things um, and during my senior year also I was um, doing my first year of my master's because I finished my undergrad in three years so I started my master's during my senior year um, and kind of like I wasn't sure if I'm going to finish my master's or not because I was going to be done with senior year and then like go back home or go overseas and you know chances of finishing my master's was kind of low because um, I would have to stay an extra year but then COVID happened um, and I got trapped in the U.S. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't leave. Um, so I was there like, you know, I was like, OK, like I'll finish this year, like end of my master's and stuff. Uh, but it kind of was the time that forced me to think about what do I actually want? Um, like I always have that notion of like okay, next year I'm going to play this, and next year I'm going to play there, next year I'm going to do this. But it was always, like, basketball focused that I kind of, I I didn't know anything else. And I was like, wait, is this still, like, I know I want this, and I know I love this, but, like, it's okay to explore other areas of my life too. Um, and I've never done that. It was always, you know, basketball, basketball, basketball. Um, so when COVID happened and there was no more basketball, I kind of had that time to think like, well, what if I don't go overseas? Or what if I don't go back home and play? Like, what if I d don't want to play anymore? You know, what are the possibilities? Um, so I was like, okay, well, at least I'm going to stay for, for that fifth year to finish my master's. It was a two-year program. Um, so to finish my master's and then like decide after that. And I mean, it was the pandemic anyway, so nothing much was going on. Um, mm -hmm. And then by the time I finished my master's, I had, like, I really wanted to, like, I was like, you know, I, I've devoted so much and so many years of my life to basketball. Like, I feel like it's time to, you know, explore what else is out there. Like, I want to have a career. I want to use the master's that I just put my heart and soul into, sure, um, sure. into making something, you know, um, out of myself besides my sports career. Um, so I made the decision and like stayed in the U.S. and I was like, I, I think this is it. Um, and it was the hardest decision I ever had to make. I, yeah, it was hard. Yeah. What was that transition like from, you know, all basketball all the time since you were a kid to maybe you started working in corporate America, things like that. What was that transition like? And did you miss the game? Yeah, um, it was hard to say the least. It was um, went through like a, an identity loss phase where I just did not know who I am if I'm not playing, you know, like I, all, all my life I was programmed to like, you know, even introduce myself. Hi, I'm Stacey. Like I play basketball. Like, hi, you know, you just, you don't know what else is out there besides your sports identity. And that was huge mm -hmm. because it was just a phase of your life. I mean, even if I had continued playing, there will still come a time where I retire. So like the fact that we just make like sports our entire identity and um forget who we are without that jersey or without that ball, um, is scary. So the transition was hard. Um and also it was COVID at the time. I was still in the US. 
Um, so I did not have a lot of family support or any of that. So it just wasn't, it was a very like challenging time. Um, my therapist helped me a lot with that. I'm very thankful for him for that. Uh, but it kind of like made me see um, just other areas of my life and kind of like tune into who I am without basketball or who I am mm -hmm. before basketball. Um, and it's like a work in progress for sure. Um, uh, but it was, yeah, it wasn't an easy transition, but I'm glad I went through it because I, I'm just, I'm very relieved right now. Mm -hmm. And, but you, you've still found some ways to stay attached to the game. If I'm not mistaken, you did some work with the Brooklyn Nets or you're still doing some work with the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, can you tell us about what, the, yep. what you've been doing there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I did want to stay involved with the game. So it's like still a big part of me and brings me joy. Um, so I got into coaching. Um, and that was also when I moved to the city, to Manhattan. Um, I was done with the Masters and all of that. So I left upstate and I moved to Manhattan. And um, I first coached actually at the um, United Nations International School in Manhattan. Um, and oh, it was wow. like the girls' high school team. Um, spend the year with them um, and it was a great year it was like just that my first year of coaching um, and then I kind of wanted to do more of like the camps and the um, like the summer camps and the trainings and like work with like individuals more than like a team especially like a high school team it's a lot of work so um, through networking and through like a couple camps that I did I was able to connect with the director at the Nets Academy um, and then he kind of like brought me on board and then it was like, you know, like join the academy team and stuff. So, um, I work with them part time. Um, I work full time, um, at a data company and then I do like a lot of the basketball stuff on the side. So I joined the Nets last summer, um, um, part time and it has been amazing. Like I still involved in the game. I still do what I love and, um, coach like you know anywhere from like middle schoolers to high schoolers uh people are very like passionate like have dreams and like want to make it to the next level so it's just nice to like live through them too mm -hmm. and that that's awesome are you still involved in any way with the egyptian national team do they perhaps use you as a resource for folks trying to come and play ball uh, in the states yeah i been actually helping uh quite a few players uh over the last like, two three years or so um like their parents reach out to me um and i kind of like you know either try to connect them with like coaches there or they are like talking to someone already and they're trying to see like okay is this a good school is this a good program or like some of them their parents are just looking for some comfort you know like they are in that position where they're sending their little daughter to college across the world or high school and they're just trying to kind of like see how what the experience is like um so i have been helping um people like that like when i can or when i have the time or when i'm in cairo um too and like trying to you know be like a a useful resource to people in that way yeah i would imagine that you're probably one of the the earlier folks like you said to to make that jump so i'm sure a lot of folks are, are leaning on you for for some advice like you said the comfort yeah. as well uh so thank you so much for your time thank you for taking us on your career journey it's it's really inspiring the fact that you took this giant Thank leap you. you know across the atlantic to to chase your dreams and i'm i'm happy that you found some uh, purpose after retirement i know a lot of athletes struggle with that but you're still able to stay close to the game um in your own ways so um you know where can people support uh, the work that you do with the nets and and where can people find you uh on social media uh can reach out to me uh on my Instagram, email, um, Twitter, anything. Um, it's just say so Navy, S A S O N A D Y. Um, I'm always looking to connect with other folks in the sports industry or like help people where I can. So yeah, don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. Yeah, I think you're the the third or fourth person I've interviewed through that Muslims in sports media Slack oh, channel. Awesome. So it's yeah, it's been an awesome networking tool. So again, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. And it was, it was great meeting you. Yeah, absolutely. You too. Thank you.